my mother would would die, <laughs> wouldn't she, Frida? amazing about Leon and Felix is that they never put themselves forward as being a hero and I, I remember dad saying words like I'm not a hero you know we just ran away there was no more option but um, I never got the sense either that Leon ever put himself up there with a big ego of being a hero is that how when you grew up Beth? Yes. Can you? Yeah, absolutely not. I think <coughs> even watching him, I think there are similarities. I think as a Jews of a certain era in a certain part of the world, it reminds me of him. I thought what he did in that Eichmann trial was absolutely amazing. Like he and his book and the, the way he's told the story, he did it back then. I feel like I'm continuing the journey on behalf of him and dad and the others that got out of there. Yeah. Things we can't forget. Yeah, here. <coughs> um, we're just gonna pass the mic to you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanna say that, that, that part of the story we should never forget the things that who people went through and who people put it through. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Um, there's a question Is this film available? I'm still in the middle of getting a distributor, and until I do that, I can't make it available because there's, as Tom will tell you, there's all these conditions about where you can show it and where you can't. But Connecticut is its world premiere. This is its official world premiere week. And I was particularly delighted that the first sneak preview in New Haven was actually right where my best girlfriend, who appears in the film, Judy Olean, now lives, at, and she's president of Quinnipiac University. So it was quite remarkable that in the same month she was um, inaugurated as the president here and I had my first screenings of the film so we've been kind of in awe and I've been spending a whole lot of time in Hamden and I'd never been to Connecticut before and I feel so connected um, and uh, really really pleased it's very and Tom asked me to stay longer to show it two more times and I did, and I'm so glad I did, because I can't yet show it in Australia. There's all these conditions for different festivals, but it is going to do the Jewish Film Festival um, later this year, and there'll probably be others. And as soon as it's available, Tom will let, I'm sure, people know through yeah. their mailing list. Any other questions? Yes, there's a couple there. I just... Okay. I just thought it was kismet the way, um, or I don't maybe that's the wrong word, the way it tagged back to this is my dad, this is my mom, and we're such a happy family. I know that was a mistake, but I just thought it, to end it like the way it began was, oh, I don't know, it seemed amazing to me. Um, and also too, there was something, I mean, your mom was a survivor too, and she had to survive like you know how is she going to leave this lovely world that she had with your father for dixie's chaos <laughs> like you know so i i and 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 i think you said too she very much was because of what she went through she was able to compartmentalize and there's this piece of my life and there's this piece of my life and they're both good in their own ways but i can't they have to be separate so yeah my, my my mother used to tell my sister 
that every, this is terrible, every woman should have a businessman, a lover, and a handyman. Smart woman. The survivor. No, we're still looking for the handyman. <laughs> <laughs> well, she knew what she was talking about. <laughs> so you found your father and you have this new family. How have you become disassociated with the family in Brussels because of this? I, I was never really close to the Brussels family um, and they, their, their children I've never really known. But I had this real need to go to Dad's remaining cousins. Two of those have died out of the three there. In fact, most of the, Leon has has passed. Um, Arthur Candell, the doctor, um, Joe Teitelbaum, who really is very funny and um, entertaining. Many of those people are no longer alive, and so. Um, the connection that I had was with the woman who didn't speak in Brussels, and we were very close, and she she totally thought it was terrific. But um, anyway, that's different people have different reactions. You know, some people said, you cannot show that scene where he shows you where you were conceived. You know, that's disgusting. So I don't know, different, different people. I'm gonna stand up. I am a child for Holocaust survivors, both my mother and my father. And I'm a Yiddish Tochter. And I think what you did is a shanda to your parents. I do believe in Yeshua. They're in heaven. They went through hell. And I don't think it was right to drag them through this. I think, I won't say no more. I'm just I very drag sorry. them through because they're no longer alive. I know, but I do hand. believe in Yeshua, a soul. And the soul is up there. That's what I believe. That's how I was brought up. And I don't think you do that to parents that have already gone through hell. I'm sad you feel that way. But for me, it was a journey that I felt I needed to take. I think it's important for people to deal with feelings, to move forward, to understand the hurt that people have gone through. And I guess the overriding thing for me was that my parents brought me up to create, to achieve, to educate, and to communicate. And I was asked a very interesting question on Wednesday night after the screening. How would your mother have reacted now to the film? And ultimately, I believe she would be extremely proud and she would be glad that she wasn't there to have to have a ruined reputation. But I think that if she'd have known how well it could turn out. I often feel her warmth and I often feel that she understands and knows. And I even wonder if my father did know. He was an amazing guy. He encouraged my filmmaking. And I think that, you know, I think everybody has a duty to pass on stories. And some people do it with just a little photo album or they tell their kids, this is what happened to your parents or my parents or you, they tell, you know, they tell stories. And I think I've been given a gift. It happened to be <coughs> my upbringing that I had a second father, but the name father and dad belong absolutely for me to Felix. But I do see Dixie as a wonderful human being and I get on with him and it is no, doesn't make any lesser relationship for my parents and in fact has brought me closer to my sister. So that's how I feel, that's my favorite. Yes. Didn't your discovered half, didn't your discovered half sister lose her relationship with her father? She had a terrible relationship with both her parents. Her mother was an alcoholic and her father left the family and went <coughs> off with other women. So I had nothing to do with that. That was, you know, that was her life. But she's worked through that now. She's actually in a really good place. She's in a brand new relationship and she's got through a lot of damage. I mean, people, 
do feel damaged at times and it is hard to move forward from from a damaged position and she certainly started with really difficult time but do I take on the baggage of other people I think if he'd been a criminal I couldn't have gone down the path but I feel that I was judging him on what his relationship with was with my mother and with me. That's all I had, and with my sister. Yes. Um, well, they say truth always wins out, and I thought you were very brave to show this, the way this woman feels and the way your family in Brussels felt. Yep. I thought it was, it was very brave of you to, to realize that people may not agree with that, especially the older generation. Did you struggle with whether to put that in or not, or was, is that just? I had a lot more than that, and I had a lot of positive um, responses, but I really wanted to explain that we don't all feel the same, but that we have to be open to other people's feelings and other people's reactions. And, you know, after those outbursts, that everybody settled down and, you know, people move forward. I think if you block and rule a line and cut people out because suddenly they've done something wrong or they've slept with somebody or they've done... You know, I think we need forgiveness, we need understanding, and we can't hold on to negativity because it makes us sick. It's not a good thing, it's not a healthy thing. Yes. We get the mic. Oh, do you, do you want? Oh, sorry. We'll just ask that. No, that's okay. Wait, we'll that's just ask that question where the mic is, and then we'll bring it back. Yes. Um, when you found out that your biological father was not Jewish, did that affect your perspective on religion and your heritage at all? No, it was really interesting because I already had I don't love religion I, I like being Jewish but I don't like people following religion like sheep I don't like, I never liked aspects of speaking in a language where people didn't understand or following a herd so for me that was just my personal thing and I found that he was a thinker like that so it didn't really change anything. It just, something unnerved me though that I saw myself as a, a, you know, a child of two Jewish, Polish Holocaust survivors. I never saw myself as somebody related to an Aussie, you know, and I don't know what it was about that, and especially Tasmania where I'm having a major nightmare because I've unravelled a wrongful conviction. So that was just kind of my head was really, it was very hard to handle. But the funny thing is, I've actually moved closer to Judaism, closer to the strength of my family and my parents and going through, I mean, we, we all look at photo albums, we all have times where we go, oh, remember this and remember that. To work on a film and to see it repeatedly, I mean, I've only just seen it a few times with an audience, like not many, and not, you know, this is the largest group of people that have seen it. We've kept it really small. It's quite amazing to relive and re-love my family. <laughs> I'm proud of them all. <laughs> Oh, has to be that close. Yeah. <laughs> At least for me, towards the end, by the end of your film, I think that message was conveyed. What you were talking about earlier about that forgiveness, or I don't know, it was a full circle. But just giving that opportunity for people to, you know, these taboo topics, mm -hmm. to kind of overcome them, you have to expose them in order to then face them and deal with them and heal from them. But so I, did, I do think that you did uh, an amazing job getting that across, getting that message across, um, kind of like opening 
people's minds today. But I was, I did want to ask about um, your father, Felix. He has an amazing survival story. And I know you just started this, like, but have you considered or maybe in the future focusing the story on just his Absolutely, and in fact, I have much more interview footage, and I think his story is really incredible. And um, yes, I yeah, would I like to do more. That would be, but would you? What format? I mean, would that be like? I don't know, that? but I've just been thinking that that would be a very good thing to do. I don't yeah. know what you think about that, Beth and Frida, but. Um, well, you can read my. Yes. And you really have it all. Frida was just saying that um, the Death Brigade, which I highly commend to you all, which you can get on Amazon, the Death Brigade, which is written by Leon, is absolutely worth reading. And maybe that, plus Felix's interview, plus going back to all of the interview material, it is worth making a film about them in much more detail. Yeah. I had to curb myself in this. We had a lot more. What do you think, Beth? I would I'd love to uh, you know, follow you through that journey. I'm not a filmmaker, but I, I'd love to see what you come up with. Definitely food for thought or film to make. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when did you find out that your parents both have had previous marriages? That is such a great question. I was in Israel with my mother, and I was 13, and I said to her, how come Dad's so much older, and how come he didn't get married before? And she said, I did. And I said, I meant, and then I just went silent. She said, we both did. And so I was 13, and it was it was like a bombshell. I don't know why a kid who finds out that their parents had some life before is such a bombshell, but it was. And that's when I found out more. I knew they'd been through the war, I knew they'd been through bad stuff, but I didn't know that they each had other spouses. Had your sister known? Did my sister know? And was she about the, about the other marriages? Yeah, my sister knew. She's she was six years older. But she was keeping it quiet. Yeah, she, she knew a lot more, but she was, she was like an adult as a kid. <laughs> she was very wise. Um, thank you so much for being here personally and just the whole story. Um, <clears throat> My mother, we just celebrated the seventh year of her death, and four hours before she died, a letter arrived in the mail from a gentleman in Ohio. I live in Connecticut. And we had no idea who this guy was. Long story short, my mother had a relationship in high school, um, and she bore a child that she gave up for adoption. But the letter arrived literally four and a half hours before she died. So I was able to, I went up to her, she died at home with cancer. I went up to her room and I read it to her, and. The only thing that could move was her right eye. Everything else pretty much was closed. and So it got a little bit of movement. So in my world, I think that she did hear the letter. But so many things of what you talk about, the shame, the secrecy, um, there's no other way. Like you said, I couldn't have told the story if my parents were alive. If this letter arrived maybe two or three weeks before, she would have been awake. It would never have seen the light of day. The fact that she was basically in a coma allowed us, and the gentleman who I've since met, he has since died, but I had a chance to have a relationship with him. It really healed a lot of wounds I had with my mother. And I think I'm the oldest girl, and my mother put rules and things on me that didn't reflect who I was as a person, but went back to what she had to deal with, you know, as a result of this relationship and this shame. It was 1950, she was Catholic, so you're Jewish, a lot of guilt still, the guilt, you know, sure. Um, but it was, um, for me, it was affirming and it really helped me deal with any issues that I had with my mom. So I see my mom in a different light. Um, you've done a wonderful job of forgiveness and the love and I, I don't take anything away. This woman's certainly entitled to her feelings, but um, 
I think you did a great job of showing love, showing forgiveness. And I think it's kind of cool that you had a relationship. Is, is Dixie still alive? Yeah, he still works full time. He's doing wow. 95 on the 4th of July. So wow. um, he's moved his retirement age from 90 to 100. He's completely, in fact, I had a lot of stuff in the film about his longevity theories because he's got all these remarkable theories and they clearly work because he doesn't seem to age much. But I think your relationship with him rejuvenated him too. I think there's been a spark. Yeah. You know, just from viewing it, you, you've added value to his life. So thank you so much for sharing this. It's really a great story. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excuse me. You're welcome. Back here. Yes. Um, his wife, his present wife, how did she react afterwards? Uh -huh. What she found out that there was more children. She was delighted. She said, I knew it and I'm keeping the history and I've got, you know, she just totally accepted it. It's just that uh, we you're talking about his current wife, the, yeah, the yeah, wife. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that when she suspects that he's looking at other women, <laughs> right, this is a guy in his 90s, <laughs> she won't make his side of the bed. That's <laughs> about as far as it goes. <laughs> I wanted to commend you. I know some people did the other night on how you. Okay. You have to use a mic. I know you don't like it. There you go. I hate using a microphone. I just wanted to commend you, like somebody else did the other night, on the balance you struck between telling your story and also handling a Holocaust story. Because from an editing perspective and a journalist that you are and telling, being a storyteller, that's really difficult to do. And you really did it with such grace and it was so smooth. And it's just edited together brilliantly. Thank you. Uh, my editor will be really very pleased with that. I'll Thank you, Tom. Yes. You know, it did everything. You laughed and you cried. And it was super special. You're a wonderful filmmaker and a terrific therapist. <laughs> well, I probably therapized myself. <laughs> um, I also have another special guest here tonight, um, and that's Catherine Wesling, who actually is the actress in a lot of my work that I film in Los Angeles, but it's all comedy, and I have you need to know that I do do comedy, and Catherine plays the executive vice president of this very dysfunctional company, and so I'm sure the scene on the bus where I say, quiet everybody, action must have been like, so typical. I don't know what you thought. Absolutely, I was I was having more flashbacks, but it, it's so. I mean, I've heard this story. You has told me this story over the years. I remember when you were first kind of discovering it, and it's just such a pleasure to see it. And all I mean, Eve's life, as you now know, is just full and multifaceted. And to see how you pulled those lines together, and I, I actually, someone said this, but. To, to fold a Holocaust story like that into this huge life is huge. I mean, it's really important and beautiful. And um, as, as a, there's so much about the movie, it's just so, uh, it works on so many different levels and it's so honest and brave and I would expect nothing less of you. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine's a, a, an amazing actress and it's such a pleasure and I was so excited when she was able to escape from work and come yeah. come from New York and get here in time. It's amazing. And you both came from New York too. It's great. Thank you. How, how will we know when your film will become available to a broader audience or accessible to maybe some of us who would like to share it? Um, a question? It's, um, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, um, I, I'm sure that it will be through um, Tom, um, but you can also go to the website manonthebus.com.au, ad.au, which is for Australia. So it's manonthebus.com.au, and we'll put all the details there. But I mean, Eventually, when there's a distribution um, strategy and plan in place, 
Um, I'm sure you can Google it and it will be available. It'll, you know, documentaries are getting great distribution now because there's such a demand and people love seeing documentaries. They're, it's really growing. It used to be that documentaries weren't that popular and now, you know, they're major. So hopefully, yeah, it will go. And when filmmakers tell me, I do announce on our email list when films go into distribution, whether they're streaming or they're also available for purchase. Yeah, so they'll be available for streaming. Yes. I'm always amazed at how many stories are still coming out of the Holocaust now.